Magic systems get a lot of attention, and for good reason. It's magic. Storm Knight inhaling, cursed energy using, scribing, all dope stuff. But something I think might actually be more important than the system and doesn't get enough attention are its users, who wields the magic. There are high concept systems that are just cool regardless of the person it's attached to, but even then, the users still define it. And that's the key word here definition. The perception of magic both in-world, in the story, and to whomever is experiencing it is largely defined by its users. I mean, how differently would we perceive the Lord of the Rings magic if Grand wasn't a word Tolkien decided to tie to everyone who had it? The system is only one half. These guys, the ones directly affecting the course of the story, they bring it to life. But the question is, how? Hold on a second. Observe the almighty pyramid of magic users, TM. Every layer is necessary to create the premium reaction between the user and the system. I analyzed way too many fictional characters doing things that are impossible for this. Also, this totally isn't an arbitrary list I came up with for my own writing. I am objectively right. In an order that I would disclose later, this first layer is what I have dubbed use diversity. On the surface, you would think it's self-explanatory. How differently do people use the magic, right? But it goes several layers deep. Like for starters, what is the system in question? Is it even wieldable? Again, half and half. The system could vary wildly in terms of diversity, which isn't always recommended. Go deep, not wide. Thank you, Brandon Sando. But it can be done and done well. Fantastic example of this is an anime, My Hero Academia, or One Piece actually, if you ignore the other thing, where no two people ever really have the same ability. In that case, the use diversity is massive. People are obviously going to use it differently because they don't have the same power. I see use diversity as not how differently people use the magic, but an inherent difference in the system. So it's less about their difference styles of earth bending or water bending and more about there are three other full bending disciplines and as a rule you do not have access to them. I'll get to why that divide as little as it may seem is very important. But the thing is as varied as the fruits are in one piece Oda still allows classification, an umbrella type that these unique magic fruits fall under. Burikoshi still narrows my hero's diversity. There are techniques like flash fire fist that you can only use if your powers work a certain way and also broad classifications which imply some level of sameness. A a different level of diversity is one where you have a standard set of abilities, but then there's heavy customization or you can pick and choose. Think then from Hunter Hunter. Here is still very diverse, but they all use the same basic principles, which is always fun to see and can say a lot about the character by how they choose to costumize. Side note, characterization by magic is immensely fun to play with. Yet another level of diversity though is doing magic thing A will always equal magic thing B. This style is the most restrictive when it comes to use diversity, and as much as this is restrictive, the users can still find ways to apply it that are unique to them in spite of constraints and rules. This is the there are different styles of earthbending. Speaking of rules though, you might have noticed how the use diversity spectrum is similar to the hard soft magic spectrum. This is really fascinating because the thing is, it's not parallel, it's actually adjacent. No shot I'm the guy using graphs to explain magic. Yes I am and I absolutely love it. This first quadrant with hard diverse magic is where a surprising amount of magic systems fall. Like a lot. It's usually in the form of the system being divided into classes and it'd be made clear what those classes are, what they bring to the table. On the harder side, we'd have Lightbringer's Chromaturgy. Around that same hardness scale, but way more diverse would be Stormlight Surge Binding. A little bit softer, less diverse, but still hard leaning is where Avatar's Bending would sit. But similar softness, way more diversity has Jujutsu Kaisen's Curse Techniques. Also, go watch that anime if you haven't. I've been screaming Season 2's praises off the rooftop. Mainly because it's a fantastic study for the relationship between user and system. <laughs> The second quadrant housing hard systems with the sameness about them has broken its erogeny. A and from Elantris, but a little bit on the softer side. And if we were to take a lot of the individual classes from the previous quadrant as full on magic systems, they would probably fall in line pretty well. Here, everyone is pretty much given the same abilities, and since it's hard magic, it's exposited decently well, which has its own effects on the story, which I will get to, as well as what all this means. But this third quadrant, though, I have christened the Ghibli Corner. Nothing really makes sense here, everything is different, unique, and has its own laws that it plays by. Watch a Ghibli movie, you will get it immediately. This last quadrant though, I couldn't come up with an example. If you have any in mind, please let me know. Because as commonplace as hard diverse magic systems are, soft systems with the same as a lack of inherent diversity are just as rare. Either that or not as well read as I thought, but I found it intriguing regardless. Imagine a system, let's say telekinesis, where everyone has the same power, move stuff with your mind, but nothing else is really given. No extents, no limits, no conditions. If it wanted to move up the scale with hardness, maybe we could say you could only move the amount you weigh, and then only at the speed you could throw it at. No, let's actually make speed scale with the size of the object. People would definitely use 
that differently. But if we wanted to shift it towards diverse, we would have to create a fundamental delineation in ability. These guys can only push, these guys can only pull, these guys can only affect inorganic matter. But as fun as this is breaking it down, I'm not just doing this for propriety sake, I'm not classifying to classify. Each of these quadrants have their own unique feeling, a purpose they bring to the magic system and the story at large. Which is why looking at your system from a user's perspective is so interesting. The first quadrant systems read like a playground since it's hard leaning there's a level you understand. But since it's also diverse, it becomes a matter of application. It's easily geared towards a problem solving function. Which user is best for the situation at hand? Who's most geared towards solving this issue? Knowing this is what you're doing with your magic system means you can put your characters in scenarios where they are the worst person for the job. Or if a user breezes through a problem, we know, hey, their magic was especially adept at this. The rules were set up earlier and they were pretty much made for this problem. If the first quadrant is a playground though, the second quadrant is just ground, I guess. Or rather groundedness. Everyone has the same abilities. You, the reader, know exactly what they do. It is the epitome of doing magic thing A will equal magic thing B. The second corner is a tool. And this is why acknowledging that divide I mentioned is so important because it separates the first and second quadrants. People can obviously use tools differently, but there is no inherent diversity. They all get the same thing. It's more focused on how adept you are at using that tool and it tickles the logic in part of the reader's brain. You might even figure out applications before they're explained to you because you're imagining how you would use it. And it is so satisfying when you're shown a new application to solve a problem that makes sense and you could have thought of within the rules but didn't. The Ghibli corner, however, is the complete opposite. It runs in pure wonder. Since nothing really makes sense and everything is different, that becomes the constant that you don't know anything. And that could be used to achieve a lot of different emotions, pure wonder, like I said. Boundless curiosity, unbridled fear of the unknown. Since this magic doesn't have a shape, it becomes simple to conform it to what the story needs, amplify themes, characterize. Simple, not easy though. This is what purists believe all magic and fantasy should be, but I digress. Systems in this quadrant can do problem solving, but eliminating stakes rather than navigating them is almost never a good story thing. And magic is kind of prone to that, especially if the particular aspect that's used is not explained sufficiently enough, which it probably isn't in this case because of the nature of this quadrant. Which is probably also why this magic tends to solve an immediate problem but make the overall situation worse, increasing stakes, not lowering them. If this is pure wonder though, I see this last quadrant as mystique. Because there is a sameness, there's not so many different things to keep track of, the reader will probably develop a sense of familiarity. There's one aspect they kind of understand, it's the everyone has telekinesis thing. But since nothing else really gets revealed because soft magic, it would revolve around that singular known concept without the upper or lower limits of what that means being revealed. I imagine a common theme revolving around this style of magic would be learning more about the system. Maybe a door for Melanchus actually falls in here. By the way, if you're curious about any book I reference, it's linked down below. Read the synopsis, pick it up for fun or further exploration, which I always recommend you do. Again, these are just theories and machinations. Oh wait, I forgot, I'm objectively right. Regardless of where a system largely falls though, it can still have specific elements that pull from other quadrants. But that takes me to the second layer of the pyramid where we start to tackle knowledge. In every facet of the word. Knowledge isn't just power, here it's magical power. And once again, it has its own mini layers. Questions. How much do the magic users know about the system? What is the difference in knowledge between users? How do they acquire more knowledge? Just like his diversity, it's something you might touch on while coming up with the system on its own. But it doesn't really get concrete until you start writing the people actually using this system. You don't get a real feel for how answers to these questions play off each other until they're on the page. And I wasn't expecting it to go here, but somehow the knowledge layer ends up determining a lot of relationships. How much do the magic users know? This question intrinsically implies there is a lack of knowledge, that users don't have complete comprehension of the magic system. Kind of like a puzzle, but you only get one piece at a time and how adept you are at magic stuff depends on how many pieces you have and if you've put them in the right place. Pretty hard to get a full picture, and some users start with more pieces than others, some users get individual pieces is faster. Regardless of the rate of learning though, the average base knowledge of the users determines their interaction with the magic. Are they apprehensive or curious because they don't understand, confident or reverent because they do? Shaping their perception of the magic and by extension the readers. Stormlight Archives, the behemoth it is, does this pretty well. It has this magical renaissance thing going on with people trying to wrap their head around things they don't fully understand. But it leans into the next question, what is the difference in knowledge between users? If the first question deals
deals with the relationship of user to magic, this interaction is user to user. What does it mean when one person understands the system better than another? Does it mean more proficiency? Is it actually desirable not to know as much because it can mess with you? How does it change the way they fight when combat is involved? If there is a big difference in the amount of puzzle pieces one user has over another, it goes without saying that it can influence the way they interact, talk, fight, beliefs even. But also, the perspective you choose to convey the story to the reader changes how they look at it as well. Side note, this is why I love writing multiple POVs. It's so fun painting the same thing from varied perspective, characters asking different questions. The third, however, how users acquire more knowledge is a moot question if the answer is they can't acquire more knowledge. They can't increase their skill, which is mostly true for softer systems, but can be for the other side of the spectrum. This relationship is between the user and themselves. It can characterize them by how eager they are to learn. If the means towards learning is unsavory, will they go that far? It also touches on whether their abilities are inborn or not, if there's still a learning curve after that, if the magic is even teachable. Inborn abilities could explain why acquiring more knowledge is impossible, you just gotta have it. Which could lean into other world building spheres like class system, politics, races. Think of knowledge like you're playing a video game, and all these questions are sliders that change how the user interacts with the story, at least around magical themes. And there are other questions too, other sliders, how trustworthy is that knowledge? What is the limit to a skill a person can attain and what affects that limit? Can proficiency be measured? I'm sure you can come up with more. These three are the ones I've deemed the most important to my stories. Your stories can prioritize others, just deduce what the answers to these questions can mean for it. That being said, the third layer is what you probably had in mind when you heard me say magic users, and that is logistics. Not the word you thought I was going to say. This is the clear cut and dry stuff, the part of magic users that you would naturally go over when just coming up with the system. Is there a classification of users? What are they called? A structure to learning? Different sources they draw from? Methods they use? Different races by extension? How rare is it to be a user then? Questions upon questions. But this is the one I think impacts the most though. What is the scale of power? It's a simple thing, but it frames the entire structure of the story relating to magic. If everyone is chucking suns at each other, it becomes harder to write an alley gang war where everyone has powers. Also, remember when I said I would disclose how I ordered the layers? Yeah, this is that part. And the order is scope of impact. Because these are questions a lot of writers naturally default to doesn't make them any less valid. All these three layers are pretty much of the same importance to magic and the story as a whole. But their effect on the story differs, narrowing along with the pyramid. The logistics questions impact on a much broader scale because it's pretty much set for the entire story when you answer them. And some answers can change and lead to their own interesting outcomes, usually for the plot, not just purely world building. But they are constant for the most part. From structures that all these sliders play off of and when one changes, it's usually a big deal. Imagine a system where they all draw power from the same sources. We want it to be a pretty rare race that uses this magic system, but their demand is pretty high and the resources don't always meet that. Those are our constants, now we apply knowledge sliders. They know a lot, but not everything about the magic system. They have a decent amount of puzzle pieces. Knowledge is pretty varied though, not everyone has the same puzzle pieces. And getting more is doable, but not always easy. So far, we've created a situation where it's every user for themselves, maybe a little war for resources even. But what does the diversity spectrum bring to the table? As we are thinking about how this system is going to be used for the plot, if at all, we decide it's going to be a harder magic system. So that would mean the puzzle pieces that the users do have are shown to the reader. And since we already kind of have this battle for resources going on, we could amplify that feeling of scarcity by giving everyone the same abilities. So the readers are told exactly why those resources matter and what a user can do with them because we decided the nature of the story required a hard system. And at this point, there is a decently clear understanding of its strengths and weaknesses, which creates a dynamic where the readers can problem solve along with the characters. The magic system I just described is a deconstruction of Mistborn's alamancy. And that's another thing I wanted to touch on. Writers tend to start with the answer first. I don't know where Sanderson started from, but I can guess it was somewhere along the lines of, I want a system where people ingest metals to give themselves different abilities. I want this ability and this ability to tie to these metals. Oh, and it'd be cool if some metals, some abilities are rarer than others. Maybe Tolkien did start by tying the word grand to every user and figuring out what that means from there. Whatever it is, you have preconceived notions about the magic system and how it's applied. That gives us our constants, the foundation of the pyramid. Then you can move up the pyramid and ask all these questions, play with the sliders and figure out what that means for your story. Then figure out which answers can elevate that particular piece even more. Because even though you have what you want to do in mind, this isn't a formula to plug in some parameters and the output you get is a complete engaging magic system. No, it works in tandem as you develop the system. An effort to recognize what you're doing in the moment so it becomes more and more intuitive. Keeping users in mind instead of only what the system can do is a great step towards that. And as always, the goal is to inspire through understanding, not have all this crammed in your head when you're trying to write. And in the vein of understanding, this video talks
talks about why you want to have a magic system in the first place. Hope I made some sense. Okay, bye.